the faith that does not cost is not really faith. Following Jesus demands that we lay down our life, pick up our cross, and follow him to death. And there are many in this world who face a cost far greater than what you and I know here. Today is the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. Churches all over are praying for those who must face those horrible costs. When the persecuted get a message out to us, the number one request is that we pray for them. So we're going to honor that request today. And I invite you to join with me as we pray for our brothers and sisters. I want to invite you to join with me on your knees, if you're able, as we pray for the persecuted church. Holy God, we come before you, our hearts stirred and troubled as we consider those who suffer for even mentioning your name. Here we are in a beautiful place without fear, worshiping you as we, by our conscience, decide to do. And yet others around the world do not have these freedoms and these privileges, and their faith costs them a great deal. Lord God, you are worthy. Of the sacrifice. I pray that we would each one of us. Count all that we have as rubbish. Compared to the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ. And having him as our Lord and Savior. And we lift up our voices to you, holy God, and ask that you would be with our brothers and sisters who are in danger, who are in prison, who are tortured and tormented for your name's sake. We pray for those who will lose their lives this very day for simply following you. And we ask our gracious Father, That you would comfort them. And that you would guard them with peace. And that you would strengthen their faith. That they would be bold in their witness and testimony of your goodness and kindness. We pray not just for the persecuted but for those who persecute. That you would rescue them from the darkness and the lies that have consumed their hearts and souls. And that you would through the testimony of your saints, increase your kingdom through their salvation. Lord God, may you be glorified in the midst of their suffering. May their faith hold strong that your kingdom might come and that your will might be done in them and through them, wherever they may be. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Suffering is the lot of a Christian. God uses suffering to grow our faith. Therefore, you and I should expect suffering to come as Christians. Our suffering may not come in the form of what we've seen this morning in the videos. But if you're a Christian, then in some form of suffering, persecution, some form should come your way. And the question is, what do we do when that suffering comes? Not if, but when. Where do we turn? I want to invite you to turn with me to Isaiah 50 this morning. The good Lord works all things together. 
where we are in Isaiah, I think, gives us the answer of what we do when suffering comes. And we'll see this morning that when we suffer, we should look to God's strength and to His servant, to the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we do, we will find purpose in suffering. We will find glory in suffering. We will find God's good pleasure even in the midst of the suffering we face. Isaiah chapter 50, as we turn to God's Word, uh, we've, over these past few weeks, been looking at different uh, perspectives of suffering for the people of Israel as Isaiah looks down the road into the future of a time of suffering in which Zion, the holy city, would be forsaken, her people would be exiled or killed. And what should Israel do in response to this desolation that they will experience? Verse 1 of chapter 50, God first has to deal with the heart of His people before He can point them to hope in suffering. It says, if you read along with me, Thus says the Lord, Where is the certificate of divorce by which I have sent your mother away? Or to whom of my creditors did I sell you? Behold, you were sold for your iniquities and for your transgressions. Your mother was sent away. Why was there no man when I came? When I called, why was there no one to answer? Is my hand so short that it cannot ransom? Or have I no power to deliver? Behold, I dry up the sea with my rebuke. I make the rivers a wilderness. Their fish stink for lack of water and die of thirst. I clothe the heavens with blackness and make sackcloth their covering. Last week we saw Zion crying out, God has forsaken me, God has forgotten me. And God says, I may have forsaken you, but I did not forget you. And God promised to bring back the exiles to fill the holy city so much that they would have to tear down and build up to be able to make room for all that would come, all of her children who would be brought back. He has promised redemption. He has promised to rescue the captive from the mighty man. He has promised to grant them freedom from the oppressor and to bring them home. But we pause here and God deals with a a heart problem that His people have. It seems from what we're reading here that Israel would look at their situation, look at their forsaken situation and say, what has God done? Why has He done this? Why has God judged us so? Why is this suffering happening to us? And so he says, where's the certificate of divorce? He says, bring out the certificate of divorce. Some people have read this to say that there is no certificate of divorce. I think God is very clearly making a point here saying, there is a certificate of divorce. And I need to see it to show you something that's written on it. Deuteronomy 24, Moses says, if you're going to divorce your wife, you're going to send her away. You need to write a certificate and give it to her. It explains this is why the divorce is happening. It provides that legal separation so she can go get remarried if she needs to. And so he says, let's bring the certificate of divorce so we can see what it says on that certificate for why I sent your mother away. They say that, 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 that God has sold them to pay off his debts. And he says, what creditors do I even have to have to pay? I mean, it's, it's crazy to think that God owes anything to anyone to have to sell his people to pay off his debt. The maker of heaven and earth who owns everything, having to pay off a debt, it makes no sense. He says, no, let's, let's look at the why. He says, you were sold not to pay off my debt. You were sold to pay off your debt for your iniquities you were sold. Let's look at what the certificate says. Your mother was sent away for your transgressions. In other words, your suffering has come because of your sin. Sin brings death, always. And so God says, this is why you've been exiled, why you are suffering. It's your own sin, don't... Try to pass it off on me. It's your fault. But then he says, why has Israel ignored me? 
Okay, God is judged because of their sin. Why is this ignored? Why was there no man when I came? When I, when I called, why was there none to answer? God, through the prophets, had been calling out to his people for centuries. Listen to me. Repent of your sins. Judgment is coming. It will not come if you repent. I mean, he's been calling out to them mercifully, pleading with his people year after year, prophet after prophet. And he says, why was there nobody to listen? Why, whenever I called you to an account to come to me and make peace, there was nobody who came. Why did you neglect my word and my offer of mercy? Is it because of me? Is there something deficient in me? God asks, is my hand so short that it can't ransom? I think ransom is a very important word here. It means to buy something back. It's a, this idea that something's been sold and you're going to buy it back. He says, you were sold not because I had a debt to pay off, but because you had a debt to pay off. You think that my hand's so short that it can't pay your debt? You think my funds are so limited that I can't pay your debt and bring you back? You think that I have no power to deliver you? He says, think about who you're talking about. I'm the Lord God who covered up the sun so that Egypt couldn't see it. I'm the Lord God who blew and the waters parted and the fish died because I wanted to make a, a dry path for you to walk and escape from Egypt. He uses this Exodus language there of saying, this is who I am. I'm the one who has the power to save. I've already proven that I have the power to save. Why would you doubt when you need salvation that I can do it? I've already shown it. You know it. My strength is enough to save you. One writer he put it this way it says it does not matter how much water is in the ocean or how bright the heavens are at noonday god can dry up the one and darken the other shall the hebrews and all the rest of the world's captives doubt that god has the power to lighten their darkness and water their deserts you may not be israel <laughs> exiled to babylon saying why god but all of us have those moments of suffering when it's comes up of why God you may not be an exile who's being oppressed in a foreign land and no hope of being able to return home but you might be in a situation where you're thinking where is God can he even stop this why doesn't he stop this Your suffering may be because of your own sins. Your suffering may be because of somebody else's sin. But when suffering comes, it is not why, God, can't you do this? That should never be in our heart. Because it is never about a matter of strength or power. God is able to save. In fact, He's the only one who is able to save. God may not save you in the time that you want Him to save you. God may not save you in the way that you want Him to save you. God may take His sweet time as we think, but God is the only one who is able to save. So when suffering comes, look to His strength. Don't doubt. Don't falter in your faith, but recognize that He who parts the heavens, he who parts the sea, he who speaks life into existence, he who crushes nations and causes other ones to rise, he is the same God who has offered to save you if you cry out to Jesus. That's the thing, we don't simply say, just, just look to God. We're Christians. We specify what we mean by God. We don't just look to the strength of a God, we look to the servant, to Jesus. Verse 4, we're going to look at the third servant song in the book of Isaiah. Each song has been progressing us in our understanding of who this servant is. And it's not until we get to the New Testament that we see the identity of the servant. Uh, the gospel writers are very clear in wanting us to understand that Jesus of Nazareth is the servant that God promised would come and save and deliver his people. All the way back in chapter 42, we saw that this servant, who's not going to be Cyrus, Cyrus is just kind of a type of the servant to come, but the true servant, he's going to be able to rescue and deliver the people of God, and not just Israel, but all the nations, and he's going to do it without lifting up his voice. He's going to do it without 
basically picking up a sword or breaking a reed. He's going to be able to save without having to fight as we traditionally think of having to fight. Two weeks ago, we saw in chapter 49 that the servant is one who's going to experience some frustration. He's going to work and he's going to come to the end of his ministry and say it's all been for nothing. And yet it's not for nothing because God the Father will give him his reward and will establish him as a covenant for all the nations so that all who believe would come to salvation in God through the servant. Here we see that it's not merely frustration, but it's actually suffering that will come to this servant as he carries out the mission that God has given him. So verse 4, if you'll read along with me, we'll read this third servant song. It says, The Lord God has given me, this is the servant speaking, the tongue of disciples that I may know how to sustain the weary one with a word. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to listen as a disciple. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not disobedient, nor did I turn back. I gave my back to those who strike me, my cheeks to those who pluck out the beard. I did not cover my face from humiliation and spitting, for the Lord God helps me. Therefore, I am not disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, and I know that I will not be ashamed. He who vindicates me is near, who will contend with me. Let us stand up to each other. Who has a case against me? Let him draw near to me. Behold, the Lord God helps me. Who is he who condemns me? Behold, they are all wear out like a garment. The moth will eat them. So the servant begins by explaining what God has done for him. He's given him the tongue of a disciple. Morning by morning, he gives a word to the servant. And the servant's job is to take the word of God and to give that to the weary, to the troubled, to the afflicted. So that he can help them. In other words, the picture is is of the servant who learns from God and takes from God and gives God's word to those who are weary and afflicted so that they can find a help in their time of need. It's amazing when we look at the Gospels that this is exactly what Jesus does. Let's read a few passages from the Gospel of John. In John 5, verse 30, Jesus says, I can do nothing on my own initiative. As I hear, I judge. In John 8, 28, he says, I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father taught me. Chapter 17, verse 8, he says, as he's praying to the Father, he says, For the words which you gave me, I have given to them. Jesus is very clear when he's walking on the earth that he is not simply making stuff up and giving it to the people. He's the Son of God. He certainly could do that, but he is the obedient servant who takes from the Father the words that bring rest and bring hope and bring peace and bring life and bring joy and bring comfort, and he takes those words and he gives them to those who are weary and heavy laden. He provides rest through the Word of God. This is his mission. This is what he goes about doing. That's why you see him going around healing people, casting out demons, feeding people, and teaching them the Word of God. To give them not simply relief from physical affliction, but relief from the emotional, spiritual affliction that they face. He says, I was not disobedient, nor did I turn back. In other words, I did what God gave me to do. And the result of what his ministry was, uh, was suffering. It's painful how closely Jesus parallels what's happened here. As we watch in the gospel of Jesus being hit in the face. Jesus being spat upon, Jesus being flogged in, on his back by a Roman ruler. We don't have death here in this passage. We have to wait till the final servant song to see that his life will end in death. But what we do have is suffering, and not simply suffering, but unjust suffering, and not simply unjust suffering, but legally condoned unjust suffering. He calls out, to those who have a problem with him, he says that, uh, you know, who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who has a case against me? Let him draw near. In other words, he's painting the picture of a trial, and he says, I'm uh, on trial, so the one who has the charge against me, come on, let's hear it. I want to fight this out. I don't have anything to worry about because God is my help. 
Because God is the one who vindicates me. A legal term meaning showing to be righteous, showing to be right, showing to be innocent. He's an innocent sufferer who does not respond by lashing out at those who persecute him. He does not respond by calling the heavenly host to just slaughter those who nail him to a cross. He responds by faith. My help is in the Lord. I don't need to do a single thing. My father will vindicate me. You do whatever you want. You want my cheek? Here it is. You want the other? I'll turn it to you. You can do what you want to me because the Lord God is my help. He responds by placing his complete and total faith in the Father. In fact, I think Peter has this in mind in Acts 2 when he says to the Jews, this Jesus, you nailed him to a cross by the hands of godless men. You put him to death, but God raised him up again. You gave your verdict. You said he deserved death. You said that he was guilty, that he was a false king, and you killed him. But God overturned your verdict, overrules your verdict. God has vindicated his servant. This is who the servant is. How are we to respond as we consider the suffering of the servant? Verse 10 and 11, we have two different responses uh, that uh, I think we need to really take into mind and into thought this morning. Verse 10, it says, Who is among you that fears the Lord, that obeys the voice of his servant, that walks in darkness and has no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. Behold, all of you who kindle the fire, who encircle yourselves or literally gird yourselves with firebrands, Walk in the light of your fire, and among the brands you have set ablaze. This you will have from my hand. You will lie down in torment. I want you to notice three things that are said about the believer in verse 10. One is that he fears the Lord. Two is that he obeys the voice of the servant. Those two are so intricately bound together that to reject one is to reject both. In other words, you can't have God without Jesus. You can't have Jesus without God. The servant speaks forth the word of God. And so if you're going to fear God, if you say, yeah, you know, I believe that there's a God, that he exists. But, you know, I think that, <laughs> that, that Allah is it, that Muhammad's his prophet. You're wrong. You got nothing. So, yeah, I believe God exists. I just don't know about this Jesus thing. I think God is just this loving being who's going to take care of us. I mean, that's what I like to think about God. You're wrong. You've got nothing. If you reject the servant in the word that the servant speaks, you reject the father who has given him that word to speak. You fear God and obey Jesus. You cannot do one without the other. This is why we cannot pick and choose what we want to listen to in the word of God and still call ourselves God-fearers or Christians. We adhere to the word of God as an act of fearing the Lord, an act of faith. But the third thing that's, that's said about this, this, this believer, I think, is very, very interesting. And I think it should almost shock us as we read it. Okay, so you fear the Lord, you obey the voice of the servant, and then he says, you walk in darkness and have no light. Wait a second, you fear the Lord. You obey Jesus. What do you mean you walk in darkness and have no light? He's not talking about moral darkness like what we read in the New Testament. He's not talking about you walk in sin. I believe he's simply talking about the darkness of our world. The misery and the suffering of our daily lives. You walk in a dark world and you have no light here. Your only hope is the light of Jesus. Your only hope is the grace of God because you have nothing else to hold on to here. And I think that this is the case because of what he then says about those who kindle a fire. So the picture is somebody who lights his own fire. So I've created fire. I've got, I can take care of myself. And you, you light your torch and you're so committed to your own fire that you have lit that you strap that torch to your arm. Nothing's going to take that torch away from your arm. And it casts light before you in the darkness, in the misery and despair of this world. You've got light to light your path. It's wonderful. I, 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 can, I can walk by my own light. But what happens when you strap a torch to your arm? Any of you, you know, lighting a birthday cake with the candles, you're not paying attention, especially when people start getting older and there's like 
80 candles on the cake, and you're you know, just lighting each candle, and you're like, man, this person's old as you're going along, and then you're not paying attention. You're holding on to that, that, the, that match as, as tight as you can because you don't want to drop in the cake. Because, I mean, it's cake. You want to eat the cake. But then all of a sudden, boom, you burn. You cling to your own fire to walk in your own light. It will consume you in the end. God says that may be what you think you're doing, but here's what you're going to have from my hand. My hand is not only too short, not too short to save, my hand is not so short that it can't judge. My hand can reach down into the very depths of darkness and pluck out the exile. And my hand can also reach into your false light and strike you down. Don't walk by your light. Christian, you may have no light in this world. You may have no hope in your job. You may have no hope in your family. You may have no hope in your health. You have, may have no hope in your retirement fund if you have one. You may have no hope in any of the things that this world says we should look to for hope, that we should walk in the light of those things. You may have nothing. You may be in darkness with no light. And the Bible says, don't try to strike your own match. Don't try to light your own torch and walk by your own light. Trust in God. Rely on the light he provides, not on the light you provide. I've been noticing in the news lately that there's been several pretty big names uh, who are coming out as Christians, saying they're having conversion experiences. Uh, sports stars and athletes who are saying they're having conversion experience, Hollywood people. Uh, the one that has uh, struck me the most lately is, and I'm going to say his name wrong probably, I did the other day. I think it's Kanye West, I think is how you say his name. If you don't know him, that's okay. I don't really know him either other than just a few tidbits about him. He's married to a lady named Kim Kardashian, reality star, and really just two icons for everything that we despise as Christians. For everything the word of God stands against. And what they do, what they sing, what they stand for, all these things. But supposedly they've had this spiritual encounter with Jesus. Now here's the interesting thing about it. This guy is actually proclaiming Jesus. Not simply I met God, but I met Jesus. This guy is going from rapping about sex and drugs and all sorts of perverted things to singing about Jesus being king. Now we need to bow the knee to Jesus, and we need to surrender our lives to him. It's been very interesting to watch as these things develop, because they are not sanctified lifestyles by any stretch of the imagination. They're still new believers, and their lives are not going to, you know, be kosher with everything that we might want it to be. But they're being very bold in their proclamation about Jesus. And whenever these things happen, uh, where some Hollywood person that you know, hey, that's not a good person, all of a sudden they know Jesus, I don't know about you, but my heart is almost immediately thinking, mm, yeah, we'll see how long that lasts. I mean, it's happening. People are accusing him of trying to make a profit off of Christianity. Uh, people are accusing him of all sorts of things. There's all sorts of judgments going out there. You know, what do we do whenever we, we look at these people, they come to know Jesus, and we think, hmm, I'm not so sure about that. I don't know if that guy can get saved. First of all, how dare us? Ever doubting the extent of God's power to save even the worst people in our society. Listen, he saved me. And if he can save me, I know who I am. I know the darkness of my heart and the wickedness of my past, present, and future. I know my weakness. If he could reach down and save somebody as foolish as me, why would we ever doubt his power to save and deliver anyone? There are none who are outside the ability of God to reach down and pluck them out. And secondly, Christian, if you wonder what those people are thinking, if they're genuine, if they're true, here's the test. What do they do when suffering hits? Because following Jesus is not about all of a sudden singing songs about him and not about all the other stuff you used to sing about. Following Jesus is not about changing your Sunday ritual to pajamas and cowboys to dressing up and going to church. 
Following Jesus is about the path of suffering. Jesus promises that we will suffer. In fact, church, if we are going to be true and faithful to the gospel message, our message should not be come and just experience all the joyful things, but it's come and die, suffer. This is the message of Christianity because this world is darkness, it's misery, it's suffering, but we have a solution that transcends all of that. That should be our message. Yes, you will suffer. But if you believe, then what happened to the servant will happen to you. This is why we look to the servant whenever suffering occurs. I don't care if the suffering is because your own foolish sins have led you down a path of destruction or if the suffering is because people just hate you because you're a Christian. I don't care what the source of suffering is. When the suffering comes, and it will, realize this. It's nothing compared to what Jesus suffered both in the extent of his suffering and the fact that he deserved none of it. And understand this, what Isaiah says about the servant here is what the New Testament says about you and me later. If God vindicates us, who is there to judge? If God says, this one is mine, my son's blood covers him, who is there to condemn Christian, there is no one in all of creation in heaven or hell who can stand before God and say that wicked person doesn't deserve your love because God has said, I have already given it. And so when suffering comes, we don't embrace doubting and a lack of faith because, oh, woe is me, God has forgotten me and God has failed me or God is unable. We forget about all of that nonsense. God is able and he doesn't forget. When suffering comes, we don't think, how can I fight? How can I light my own torch, fight my own battle, pick myself up, defeat the enemy, and stop this suffering? We say, if you want my cheek, well, here's the other. Take it. You want my back? It's got some good places there. Have fun with it. I don't care what you do to me. Because my God is my help. It's what we're seeing all over the world with these people that we watch in these videos who suffer for the name of Jesus. When that suffering comes, they don't go pick up swords and start fighting. When the apostles were flogged for preaching Jesus, they rejoiced because they were like Jesus in that moment. Jesus knew a life of suffering, and he knew how to respond to it. If you want to respond appropriately to suffering, do what Jesus did. Put your faith solely, wholly, completely, only in the Lord God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that what is true for Jesus is true for those who are in Christ. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for... (laughs) Not simply dying on a cross and rising from the dead, but for calling us to be yours and for granting us a share in your inheritance. I thank you for the example that you have set for us that we might be able to look at our own suffering and know that the Father who is faithful to bring you up from the dead will be faithful to do the same for those who trust in you. But God, it is hard. It is so hard. Please, Lord, bring comfort and peace to those who suffer. But more than anything, bring faith to them. That we might not walk in the lights that we have established. Those lights that are deceptive. And those lights that will fail us. But that we might walk solely in the light of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Lord God, I praise you. For you are good even In this dark world, you are good. So please, Lord, help us to keep our eyes on Jesus, to put our faith in your goodness and your mercy in the work of Christ on the cross. And we might be able to face suffering and be okay. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Does your faith cost you? Think about this. Does your faith cost you. It may not cost you what believers in North Korea are having to face. But if your faith costs you nothing, 
I want to encourage you today to consider what kind of faith you really have. We live in an evil world. It hates God. It hates morality. It hates the truth. And if we embrace those things and we follow Jesus, then inevitably the world will hate us. It may not cost you your life, but it may cost you a relationship. It may cost you a promotion. It may, it may simply cost you the things that you have in your sin enjoyed doing, but now you know I need to not do that anymore because I'm following Jesus. I don't care what it costs you. My question is, does it cost you anything? And if it doesn't, then my invitation to you today is to find some real faith in Jesus. Yes, it means sacrifice. It means suffering. But it means life, eternal forgiveness of sins, and peace with Almighty God. There is nothing greater than following Jesus. So no matter the cost, if that's you today, when we stand and sing, come and I'll share with you how you can follow Jesus. Christian, brother, sister, we may not suffer like they do around the world. We need to pray for them. Not just one day here, but every day. We need to pray for them. But we also need to be willing to suffer. We need to be willing to take the freedoms that we've been granted and to share our faith with the world out there, even if it means they'll hate us. Suffering is the lot of a Christian because it was the lot of Christ. If we're going to follow him, let's be like him. If we want his reward, we have to embrace his path. Christian, follow Jesus. Stand with me. Let's sing.